All right, now a retired constitutional court judge, Kate O'Regan, has been appointed as the designated judge to oversee the tracing of those who may have contracted COVID-19. Spokesperson for the Justice Minister who appointed her says the Disaster Management Act allows for contract, uh, contact tracing and for a database to enable the tracing of those who may have come into contact with any person with the virus. The designated judge has the responsibility to safeguard the privacy and personal information of persons during that process. Minister Ronald Lamola says O'Regan is known for her commitment to human rights, social justice and the rule of law. Well, Justice Kate O'Regan joins us now via Skype. Judge, thank you for being with us. The first thing I think people want to know is will you take this seriously to, to protect our privacy? Yes, of course. And I need to say that the regulations are drafted in a way that takes privacy seriously. Um, but obviously, it is important for government to be able to get information in order to protect the access to health care. So we, we've got a situation here where we've got two human rights that both have to try and be accommodated at the same time. And the, what the regulations provide for is the ability of government to ask cell phone service providers to provide them with location information only about people who have tested positive or are reasonably suspected to be um, positive for COVID-19 that location information from the 5th of March 2020, when COVID-19 started to spread in South Africa until the disaster is declared to be ended. The role that the judge has is to monitor the names and people who are being, um, who are being uh, included in the register whose information has come from the cell phone service providers on a weekly basis, and also to make recommendations to three government departments that um, cooperative governance and traditional affairs, health and justice and correct correctional services, all of whom are at the front line of seeking to contain the virus within South Africa. So, so once they have that location data, let's just talk about how it works, then they can see um, other cell phones belonging to people who were in, uh, in range of that person and contact those people and say, go and get tested. Exactly, or, or go and test them if they think it's appropriate. So the, the, the purpose of this is to, to try to con contain the virus by identifying people who are positive and the people they've come into contact with to make sure that we control the virus within our community. Do you have the right information to do your job? Uh, and I understand that the Director General of Health must file a weekly report setting out the names of people who were traced. So the tracing would already have been done. You just check that everything is okay. Well, I mean, it's, you know, we are, I think it's important to realize that this is the first major public health global emergency we've had in the last 70 years, really, uh, that, uh, that is of this scale. and. I think every country around the world is trying to work out what is the best way to, on the one hand, ensure that the public health is protected to contain the spread of the virus, and on the other, to respect privacy. So what the key role of the, um, investi of the judge here is to make recommendations to those three government departments about what to do to make sure that privacy is protected during this period. As I said to you, already it's clear that it's only location information that is going to be provided to government not the content of any um, communications that have been um, made over that uh, cell phone service, nor uh, in addition, there is a provision which makes it clear that the data must be destroyed six weeks after the end of the emergency. And thirdly, the, the regulations make clear that every person who has in fact been included on this database will be notified within six, month, six weeks of the end of the emergency. So there, there are a range of protections and clear limitations contained in the regulations itself. I think obviously there's going to be need to ensure that the database itself is fully protected and may not be hacked and that it is limited uh, to the use only of um, the public health purposes for which it is being compiled. So those are the sorts of things one would think about. But I think uh, over the next few weeks, we'll all be thinking very closely about how best to make sure um, that both the public health um, protection that is that is the right of all South Africans is enabled, but also the privacy is appropriately protected. What signs of abuse will you be looking for? Do you think there'll be a temptation to, to abuse that data? 
Well, I think that what one would want is one, some clear indications from government as to what steps it's doing to ensure that the database is held confidential. It's required in the regulations that it is maintained as confidential and used only for public health purposes, but one would want to be sure that government is taking steps, and I have little doubt that government is wanting to do that. That's pretty clear in the regulations, but that's we're going to need to um, follow up on that. Um, and I think that uh, what is also clear is that because whenever you want to limit privacy, you want to give the purpose for which it's being, um, it's being infringed. Here, it is clear that if government were in any public way to use the information gained for a purpose other than public, um, for other than public health, that would be clearly unlawful in terms of these regulations. So they're pretty tightly drafted, the regulations, but I think we are we're in um, uncharted waters, and I think in these circumstances, public policy is having to make um, plans to operate before our real, a full scientific understanding of the nature of this epidemic um, is available. Science is doing its best, but 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 one's having to make public policy in circumstances where um, a full understanding of the nature and of the transmission of the disease and its. Um, uh, and, and its course is still unavailable. Well, well, I did want to ask your opinion, really. Do, do you think that contact uh, tracing will work in South Africa? We're, t we're talking about people um, maybe taking several taxis a day with several people on board. At one point, trying to find all these contacts might be a tsunami. I think it's clearly a very challenging task that government's taken on. And I think it's... it's what we do know is that contact tracing has been important in controlling um, the spread of diseases of this sort in other parts of the world, but it is undoubtedly um, a, a, an enormous task. While our numbers remain relatively low, and of course the other big challenge is um, how certain we are of our numbers uh, as, uh, that are being published on a daily basis, we, it's very difficult to know when you haven't got a very wide basis for testing. But while our numbers are low, this may still be possible. But obviously, the larger your numbers get, the more difficult the task becomes. Indeed. Right now, uh, you, you say this process may evolve. I mean, we, we're all uh, just playing in the dark here. But are you happy with the regulations as they stand? I, I certainly think that the, there's been a serious attempt in the regulations to recognize that privacy does need to be protected and to take what steps can be done to protect it. I think a lot of this is going to be a question of implementation and how it works, but I, I have little doubt of government's seriousness of purpose in trying to ensure, firstly, that the health of South Africans is protected, and secondly, that to the extent they can, privacy is protected too. All right, thank you for your time tonight. That was Justice Kato Regan, the judge who will oversee the tracing of those who may have contracted COVID-19. We take a short break. Lots more to come on The Full View. Oh, <laughs>